Okay, let me start again uh, because there's some problem with the recording. Uh, so, um, so today uh, we are going to first look at uh, budget statement uh, 110. Uh, then uh, we will look at budget statement 62. And the rationale for that is uh, to remind everyone that we have evidence that uh, in the early history of Gongchik, there seem to have been two different ways of arranging the different chapters in the Gongchik. So what is today universally considered chapter six, the chapter on view, meditation, and conduct? Uh, in, in the earliest versions of the commentary on Gongchik, uh, that was considered chapter one. And uh, this chapter that is now uh, the vital point on the turnings of the Dharma wheel, uh, that is now chapter one uh, in some of the earliest commentaries, uh, it also uh, is pushed to chapter six. So there is alternate ways of uh, reading the arrangements. So that's why I would like to also uh, kind of read uh, the contents of chapter one and the contents of chapter six kind of hand in hand uh, where it is, it makes sense. So anyway, let's look at 110 first because it continues from 19. Now 111 is going in a slightly different direction. Bear, bear in mind that right these uh, uh, individual Vajra statements that Sherab Jungne uh, uh, collated, so to say, right, collected, collated, uh, arranged into chapters. Uh, this is not. Uh, a single cohesive work uh, that someone sat down and wrote uh, from page one uh, to page 100, 100. But rather, these are collections of uh, statements. Uh, so in the same way, uh, if you think of like, for example, uh, some of you are probably familiar with this, the Dhammapada, right? So the Dhammapada um, is a collection of different sayings of the Buddha and arranged into these chapters uh, and each chapter is given a title uh, and sometimes the title uh, is is uh, tells you the topic of those sayings in the chapter sometimes it's just a common word that occurs a lot uh, or a common imagery a common metaphor uh, that occurs in all the sayings in that chapter uh, and that's how it's organized into a chapter. Uh, so at the same time, we don't need to be so rigid, right, about the chapters. Uh, and in fact, in that sense, you know, if anything, you know, I think Kyoba Rinpoche uh, is always very careful uh, to prevent or wanting his students not to rigidify any of these teachings, uh, but instead to always have this broader view uh, a broader view that can bring everything together, uh, that can see the interconnected ways of everything. So I think it's important, like, because, you know, obviously because we're studying this particular text, uh, and most of us are kind of new to uh, the way Kyopar Rinpoche looks at things, and the Kyopar Rinpoche teaches things, emphasizes uh, the Dharma, the way he emphasizes them. So, you're going to have a feeling that we're going to we're be we're saying, well, the Gong Chik's view is like this, the Gong Chik's view is like that. But do keep in mind, you know, that actually the Gong Chik resists. You can say that Gyoba Rinpoche resists any attempts to say, you know, it is like this or it is like that. Because once you say it is like this, almost without choice you're excluding it is like that yeah so so we we have to you know even as we want to see kind of more accurately more clearly you know the way Kipa Rinpoche understand things you know, understand the dharma the, the Buddha, buddha's dharma we should not you know make the mistake that he is concerned about which is to turn this into Oh, this is a special view. Oh, this is, you know, the Dragon way of looking things, you know. So be careful uh, not to do that as well. 
because if anything, he's always reminding us, you know, that we need to have a more comprehensive understanding of the Buddha's teachings, a more comprehensive understanding. Then, of course, within that, you can say, you know, so then he emphasizes how uh, dependent origination or cause and effect and emptiness uh, are two sides of the same coin. Uh, that the fundamental nature of all things uh, consists of these two sides uh, that do not contradict each other, uh, do not oppose each other. So, so that, then within that understanding, all the different teachings uh, should be understood as part and parcel of a cohesive, uh, holistic uh, way to uh, practice the teachings, to understand the teachings, and to finally realize uh, the result. Right? And the result is said to be the one single result of the Buddha state. Yeah. So, statement 110. Anything taught as the six positions is only definitive meaning. So the first thing I want to say here is, um, here, clearly, Jitin Sumin, Gilba um, uh, accepts and recognizes uh, that you can talk about these six positions. Uh, in fact, these six positions, uh, if you comb through uh, the Buddha's, uh, all the texts that are attributed to Buddha, all the sutras and tantras uh, that the Buddha, uh, supposedly, Buddha taught, right? If you comb through them, you, you, you can see, find vocabulary uh, that corresponds to what's here grouped as the six positions. And the six positions um, in the notes, uh, Sobish tells us, it's uh, so on page 89 under the notes for 110, uh, the six uh, positions uh, or six hermeneutical principles. Uh, I'll explain that. It's a long fancy word. Hermeneutical principles is the intentional, the non-intentional, the provisional meaning, the definitive meaning, the literal and the non-literal. So, so straight up, you know, here, Kyoba Rinpoche says, yes, you, you can, uh, you can, and in fact, you have to, right? Um, understand uh, the diversity of things that the Buddha reportedly said uh, using these six positions to help you understand. But what should it help you help us understand? This is where I think this Vajra statement, uh, what this Vajra statement is saying. What should the six pos positions help us understand? Mm -hmm. The six positions should help us understand that even though uh, taken like uh, certain statements, certain things the Buddha said here and here and here and here and here, uh, first of all, they might seem contradictory. But they will seem less contradictory when we understand Oh, here uh, it is non-intentional. And over here, it is literal. And over here, uh, it is provisional meaning. Okay, so that's the next step. Then you begin to see, ah, right, right, right. So the Buddha uh, is not like contradicting himself. But Kyoba Rinpoche is saying, but don't stop there. If you stop there and then stop and stop at the conclusion that the Buddha, certain things the Buddha said uh, can be ignored uh, because it is not uh, definitive, because it is not intentional, uh, because it is not uh, literal, uh, then uh, that's uh, problematic. Instead, we have to understand that even when he was speaking uh, in a way that is non-literal or in a way that is provisional or in a way that is non-intentional, his final intention, gongpa, gongchik, his final intention, meaning like what is still behind 
uh, speaking in a non-literal way, speaking in a non-direct way, it is still uh, intended to direct us uh, into understanding the definitive meaning. So this statement, uh, anything taught as the sixth position is only of the definitive meaning, or as I said last time, for definitive meaning, for leading us to understand the definitive meaning. I would say this yeah, is what this statement is saying. So, uh, Shirab Junay says, so this statement, this Vajra statement, was given, was said by Kyopar Rinpoche in response to what? In response to, so above, people claim that since the Buddha taught all statements as meaning further, uh, as meaning requiring, requiring further explanation, uh, quote unquote, as definitive meaning and so on, the Tathagata taught some of these statements as a skillful lie. So here, uh, it is in response to the idea that the Buddha would tell skillful lies. And this is some I, something that Kyopar Rinpoche is very careful and concerned about, saying, no, Buddhas absolutely do not lie. Uh, no matter what, they don't lie because they have completely purified uh, the ability, uh, the, the causes of lying. Uh, so in a way, you could say, you know, they're simply incapable of lying. Uh, even if uh, you force them, even if they force themselves, they're incapable of lying. Yeah. Now, this might seem to us to be something dogmatic. Oh, it's so insisting that, you know, that he has so completely purified himself of any and all, right, uh, ability to uh, even utter a falsehood when it is necessary, um, that why do, you, do we need to push it so far? You know? Here, I think it's really about helping us to not so easily uh, use the excuse of, oh, for a greater good, oh, for a good reason, oh, for, you know, to protect someone, huh? I, I will just lie. Huh? I will just lie skillfully. Because that, you know, can easily kind of snowball. Huh? First time you tell a first lie huh? and you say, oh, this is, you know, uh, in order uh, for a good reason. Then the next lie has to come. Then the next lie has to come. Then the next lie has to come. Then you have to keep track of which lie is which lie, which lie you told which person, and so on and so forth. And before long, you know, <laughs> we're gone. In a way, it doesn't really matter whether Buddhas can or cannot lie because we're not Buddhas. What point is that to go, you know, border with Buddha's business? Here, I think, is saying, yeah. We should not so quickly, you know, approve of ideas like, oh, Buddhas can, you know, tell skillful lies uh, in order to lead people uh, to a good place. Yeah. Saying, no, Buddhas don't lie, period. So questions or comments before we look at Chudrak's commentary? So I guess I've given my commentary first. <laughs> Any comments, questions? Okay, on page 89, what you just spoke of, uh, this is Joan speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, at the bottom of 89, it says, Some people, who are the some people? Some monks, Rinpoche's? Oh, I this find is a this lot, a lot. Very upset. 
there, there's it's a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of uh, other people. Uh, doesn't matter, Rinpoche is monks, you know. These are positions held by uh, some of the Buddhist masters. Yeah, this is common. I mean, you read, you know, you, you read some, some of the books that are out there. Huh? Um, there, there, are, there are people who, who say this, you know. If you look carefully, it's it's out there. This idea, Doctor Lai. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the six uh, different ways of interpreting yes. are really dependent on the uh, on the hearer. That it, they they can all point have a meaning that uh, is only interpreted in these different ways mm -hmm. by the person who's receiving the teachings. Yes. Yeah, so so here Kyoba Rinpoche is not uh he is not um denying, yeah? Uh or dismissing uh, the the usefulness of understanding these six uh, positions. Sometimes called the six parameters. Six ways, as as Larry just said, interpreting right um, the different the different statements, uh, the different things that the Buddha said here, there, everywhere. Uh, but he is one; he is careful, or he is concerned to remind us, even when uh, uh, what he says, you know, clearly it is uh, non-literal. Uh, and there are some examples given, you know, it, where. Uh, it says, uh, I, I, even in the Dhammapada, you know, in, in, that so-called doesn't have uh, Vajrayana teachings. It has things like says, you know, I, I think if I remember correctly, it has things like say, that says, you know, kill your father. Yeah. Even in the Dhammapada. So there you can say, you know, Kyo Barimbache is not saying, oh, uh, uh, don't use this guidance guidance of like understanding that sometimes the buddha speaks literally sometimes the buddha speaks non-literally <laughs> those are one of the six ways right five and six literal and non-literal on page 89 yeah. uh, kyo is not saying like oh no everything the buddha says is just literal no 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 sometimes literal sometimes non-literal but whether he's speaking literally or non-literally he does not lie. I think the real issue here is the idea of skillful lying. <laughs> As uh, Ken Jenner Budget likes to say, he says, there is no skillful lying. Lying is lying. <laughs> if it is really skillful, there is no lying necessary. So he, he tells this story, you know, way, way back when I first started studying with him, he says, you know, he tells this story. He says, you know, this is the, and, and I've heard this story, people saying, you know, for example, if you, if, if you see someone running by, you know, like really like terrified, you know, and runs off in front of you, then a few seconds later or minutes later, you see someone else come by, you know, with a gun or with a big knife, right? And then he says, did you see this person? And he describes the person. Huh? Did, you, did that person come by? Mm. Then he said, you know, uh, uh, ordinarily we say, oh, you should lie. Huh? And say, oh, no, I, I didn't see that person. And he says, uh, that's normally what you would think uh, that you should do. Uh, then he says, obviously, you should not say, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw, you know, you told the truth. Uh, in this case, telling the truth, uh, no. Uh, you cannot say, oh, yeah, yeah, he went that way. <laughs> right? So obviously, don't do that. 
And he says, and also he says, also don't say, oh no, I, I, I didn't see anyone. He said, you might call that skillful lying. He says, that's not skillful. And he says, lying is never skillful. And he said, then, then we are like, so what are you supposed to do? He said, well, you can distract this person. <laughs> he says, that can be skillful. You can say, oh, you look kind of tired. You want to have a cup of tea? So he says, don't resort to lying. You distract this person. Uh, so you, you buy time for the guy that is running. Yeah? You distract this person. You're like, oh, you look tired. You know, what is the matter? You know? Of course, luckily, most of us, you know, don't find ourselves literally in those situations, life and death, right? But yeah, the point is, you know, this idea that skillful lying, yeah, it says, no, don't, don't, <laughs> don't so quickly buy into the skillful lying. So the commentary, Chodra's commentary, since Buddha, the exalted one, does not change from sameness, namely great peace, to be something else, the excellent teachings too do not change from being one thing to being another. Moreover, it is impossible that he taught the Dharma variously as truths and falsities of the six positions where some have a meaning requiring further explication and some are of definitive meaning. So the Chandra Pradipa Sutra says, Kumara, I'm going to instruct and teach you. Have faith, I'm without falsehood. The Buddha does not lie. Out of compassion, the victorious one always speaks truthfully. Then an, another quote, you know, uh, to show how Buddhas uh, have no capacity to lie, you know. So anyway, moving on. Since the Buddha taught this, all teachings included in the three vehicles are none other than the feminine, definitive meaning alone. Yeah. Again, saying this doesn't cancel out uh, that you you still can and should use the six interpretive uh, possibilities uh, to look at the different statements that the Buddha has made. You just need to understand that. Mm, in making those statements in various ways, it's not out of needing to lie. It is not speaking falsity. It is still, what it is leading us to is still to the definitive meaning. So he says, moreover, there may be an infinite number of people who nowadays make explanations of such categories as the intentional and the unintentional concerning what is taught in the tantras of mantra through symbols and signs, but they are completely off the mark. Statements in the new mantra such as enemy of the teachings signify wind, thoughts, and so on. And so here, Chodra is saying, you know, when in the tantric teachings, it says, uh, you should kill enemy of the teachings. Uh, what the Buddha is talking about is uh, impure winds, uh, meaning uh, impure wind energy that moves in our body. <clears throat> and when impure winds move, uh, then thoughts become clouded. <laughs> thoughts become afflictive emotions. Furthermore, statements such as do not pay homage to a stupa and attend to your sister as the karma mudra. Karma mudra uh, is sort of like a uh, sexual 
yoga partner. Uh, so statements like that. So Chodra is purposely choosing these very kind of like shocking statements. Uh, signify that one should not pay homage to the Hinayana and one should not be separate from the mudra of discriminative knowledge. These are teachings by way of code, as in, they are coded language. Moreover, such teachings in the old mantra as, if the central pillar is knocked down, the tent is stable. If the eastern window is closed, the room is bright. If you kill the kind parents, it will be virtuous. Imply the transformation of the impure channels and of winds and vital essences into gnosis, by binding of the karma wind in the central channel. Furthermore, they imply the birth of the self-arising gnosis in the mental continuum through the practice of the inseparability of objects of perception and the object possessor and accomplishment of the body of inseparable means and discriminative knowledge by cutting off the movement of the sun, i.e. mother, and moon, i.e. father, element with the wave or the mixing and transference of hatred and desire by piercing them to the heart. By such a use of symbols, the Buddha had in mind the proclamation of secrets in a hidden manner. However, those who think that the Buddha taught with many intentions other than that are just completely mistaken. Thus to say that something that is a meaning require further class of clarification and intentional and non-literal statement is like the skillful use of a lie and should ultimately be abandoned and that something else that is of definitive meaning, not intentional and literal is the truth and must be accepted is creating categories such as true and false for the perfect Buddha's teachings, which one must then must respectively, respectively abandon and accept. It's nothing but very evil karma. So, so, so here is saying it's like, uh, if you, and and it's true again. Uh, uh, if you look carefully, a lot of, not not a lot, but you can find this this kind of mistaken ideas, uh, in in some of the books that are being published today. Uh, and also among certain uh, communities, you'll he you hear people saying things like, oh, uh, those earlier teachings, uh, particularly like the, the so-called Hinayana, you know, oh, when you advance further, you know, since those earlier teachings, uh, they are not definitive, mm, they are not direct, uh, at some point, uh, you should abandon those uh, because now you have become higher. So you don't need those anymore. You you can you can abandon them. And and Kyoba Rinpoche here is concerned with this idea that once you say that certain things the Buddha says are skillful lies, skillful falsity, and certain things are truth, then if you accept that, then of course, at a certain point, you have to say the falsities needs to be abandoned needs to be left behind because it was only useful to propel me to a better place, to a higher place on the path. But he's saying, no, nothing, nothing that the Buddha taught should be abandoned because there are no lies. There are no falsities in anything that the Buddha taught. So you do not like graduate to a higher level where not killing or not lying is no longer uh, applicable to you. Again, if you look around, there are these ideas that, you know, uh, you don't have to abide by the rules uh, the further you have advanced. Maitreya Nata says, a scholar greater than the victorious one does not exist in this world. The omniscient one knows everything and the supreme true reality Others do not. Therefore, any sutra that was set down by the great hermit himself do not interfere with it. Since you would demolish the sage's ways, you would harm the excellent dharma. 
again, there are people who will say, you know, oh, the Mahasiddhas, you know, that, that's the real stuff. Huh? We follow that. We follow in that tradition. Oh, even I hear people saying things like that. Oh, we follow Guru Rinpoche. Oh, we, 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 we are different, you know, like we, we don't follow like the Hinayana style. And so basically they, they, they want to like sweep away the monk's way. Uh, they would call it, you know, especially in the West, and uh, they call it like in the in the in the kind of uh, like, oh, that's like Buddhism for dummies, you know. Uh, we are the Mahasiddha way. Uh, we are the Vajrayana way. We don't need those things, and those are only given for those who are lower. So you have to this day people uh, who 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 think like this uh, and teach like this even. I mean, they're not going to outright say, you know, uh, uh, oh, you know, Shakyamuni, forget about it. They're not going to outright say that. But when it comes to more kind of like uh, uh, outside the context of, you know, if you point a gun at them and you say, do you think Shakyamuni is inferior, you know, uh, or not pointing a gun, but you know, if you ask that, you know, they're not going to say yes. But they kind of say it in another way. Like, oh, yes, yeah, Shakyamuni, that's the monk stuff, you know. We we are like, you know, Tilopa. Uh, we are like, you know, Vajadara. Uh, we are like Guru Rinpoche, you know, and we, we don't need these things. Yeah, this is the problem, you know. So, Maitreya Nata, you know, says, uh, Maitreya Nata is the Buddha Maitreya uh, in the uh, Uttara Tantra. He says, you, we should not have this kind of view. Therefore, the victorious one has taught the Dharma as the one single thing. Later, scholars put into practice such explanation as that of the six positions as being definitively true and so on. They abandoned some parts of the Buddha's teachings and accepted others. Presented the words that pronounced the meaning further, requiring further interpretation, the definitive meaning, and the six positions as ornamentations, and made judgments as to whether the thing expressed, the Buddha's instructions, were true or false. This is but an act without liberation, as Maitreyanatha taught. Yeah, so, this is what the statement is about. Uh, page 90, so this is useful. Uh, Dorshema, uh, this earliest commentary, briefly summarizes the key point of the statement through a quote of Belden Nyepupa, who was one of Jidensungun's closest disciples. He says, Meaning requiring further interpretation, so that's one of the six parameters or the six positions, and definitive meaning are not different. Since the meaning requiring further interpretation of all scriptures is not deceptive, it is definitive meaning. So just because it needs further interpretation doesn't mean uh, that it is false. Uh, or skillfully false, and at some point you can uh, kind of dump it. It doesn't mean that. Now, concerning the function of the six positions, Dorje Shera, the Dorshema writes, the exalted Buddha has attained Buddhahood as something that is the essence of all phenomena. Therefore, to liberate the trainees, sentient beings, from the transmigrations of the three worlds, he taught the fundamental nature of samsara and nirvana in agreement with how it is within dependent origination of cause and result. Thus, any teaching system, such as the six positions, created to accomplish the happiness and bliss of sentient beings are the play of the limitless masters of the means of training the trainees. Therefore, since the six parameters altogether comprise a teaching, for guiding sentient beings to places of spontaneously accomplished great bliss, from that perspective, all the scriptures would comprise a meaning requiring further explanation. Since it is certain that through all the teachings of the Dharma, as in the six positions, 
the result will infallibly arise as the accomplishment of the vast happiness of higher realms and definite goodness for all sentient beings, and as not being born in the suffering of samsara and the lower realms, all the six positions are only definitive meaning, and there is no difference in meaning. So there might be difference in expression, but there is no difference in meaning. The meaning is necessarily definitive. Everything the Buddha taught, the meaning is definitely definitive. By definition, Buddha's words are pointing to that clear truth. But the way those words are established, the way those words are used, the way those expressions, statements, sometimes the Buddha has to conceal. Sometimes the Buddha has to speak in code, especially a lot of the Vajrayana things, the Buddha spoke in code. But the meaning is still definitive. Questions, comments? <laughs> One of the things that um, this is saying to me is that we should be very careful about what we read. Yes. And if we're reading something that seems contradictory or doesn't make sense, we mm -hmm. need to check it out at right. the meeting and just be careful. Yes. Especially in, in Buddhist teachings, you know, when it says like, oh, uh, you know, uh, all these, you know, uh, moral ethical things, you know, they're, they're secondary, you know, once you're in the Buddha state, you know, th this is, uh, this is not relevant anymore, right? Statements like that uh, is based on the idea, you know, that the Buddha gave uh, these things only to those who are uh, uh, inferior. Mount, and, and of course, you know, when you listen to that, you know, most people are like, well, I'm not inferior. <laughs> In, um, at least at the level of expression, you know, there are those, you know, you don't so much find it actually in, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, but you find it uh, kind of, you know, I, I studied this, you know, my, my graduate advisor is, his area is Japanese Buddhism. So we studied a lot about the different uh, uh, forms of Japanese Buddhism. And in Japan, the way that they have understood uh, uh, the, the Dharma is, it, it's very much uh, kind of animated with this idea that uh, there is the provisional truth and the ultimate truth. And for them, provisional truth is something to be abandoned. And so then all the different traditions will say, what we have is ultimate truth. Right? So the most extreme form I can say is the Nichiren tradition. And some of you might be familiar with that. Uh, the Nichiren tradition, again, has many different branches. The most active one uh, outside and throughout the world is the tradition called Nichiren Soshu. And then, of course, Nichiren Soshu, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, further separated into Soka Gakkai uh, and Nichiren Soshu. Uh, but they're basically from the same branch. Mm -hmm. 
And in this Nichiren tradition in general, although again, there are variations, in general, they say, the ultimate truth is only found in the Lotus Sutra. So any other sutras are actually falsehoods that the Buddha gave temporarily, that once the Lotus Sutra was taught, everything else has been invalidated. And not only is following the other sutras not going to lead you to the goal, in fact, it would even lead you to the lower realms if you follow that. I'm not making this up. Read, you know, <laughs> read what Nichiren said. So Nichiren says, you know, you should only follow the Lotus Sutra and particularly the Buddha that was revealed in the Lotus Sutra, right, in chapter 16 of Lotus Sutra. It's called the Eternal Shakyamuni. It says that that is the only valid Buddha. All the other Buddhas, uh, Amitabha, Medicine Buddha, all those, uh, they were all provisional. So now that the ultimate has been revealed, uh, to still insist on being stuck with the provisional uh, is a, like a, a cause for the lower realms. <laughs> then, of course, that's the general Nichiren across the whole Nichiren family. Uh, they subscribe to that. Then the more extreme, I, I would qualify as extreme form, is Nichiren Soshu, where they take a step further to say, and actually, the, what they call true Buddha revealed in the chapter 16 is not the historical Shakyamuni. The historical Shakyamuni belongs to the first section of the Lotus Sutra, which is within the context of the Lotus Sutra being ultimate. The first section is provisional. The second section is ultimate. So dump the first section, adopt the second section. And the second section, who is the eternal Buddha? Nichiren himself is the eternal Buddha. <laughs> and the teachings of the eternal Buddha is the only ones that are valid today. In Tibetan Buddhism, Mm. Things never got so far, so extreme. Uh, but, but in other places, they are, you know, it went in those directions. Now, I'm not saying, uh, this is different from saying, uh, that I think, you know, people who are Nietzsche and Soshu or Nietzsche and uh, go about thinking, you know, you're all bad, you're all evil. I'm just saying, if you read uh, those writings, uh, they express things in, in that manner. Now, to be truly kind of to the spirit of what Jigden Sungun is teaching, right? I would say, with yourself, there's still a way to even bring in such extreme positions. <laughs> as long as you don't turn it into that extreme, you can still say, I believe, yeah, there's a way to kind of understand them and say, okay, that's why they speak like that. Okay, sure. If by believing that they can be led to a greater understanding, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's my attitude. Uh, even with such extreme positions, you know, it's like temporarily they need to be there, it's okay. Uh, if they have become better people, right? Which I can see, you know, actually I can see uh, people who have, uh, I have some family members actually who have turned to Nietzsche and Soshu. You know, except that they have this weird idea, you know, about other Buddhists, but they actually become good people, you know, happy, uh, compassionate, loving, you know. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's fine. <laughs> so as long as yourself don't, you know, end up subscribing to something like that, I think you can make, you know, room for even that kind of, you know, rigidity. Because you don't want, you know, the all-inclusiveness yeah, uh, approach yeah, to be only inclusive insofar as, you know, uh, 
not allowing anyone to be exclusive. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> kind of like they say, you know, the liberal in the US, in the West, the, the liberals are only liberal if you're not conservative. If you're conservative, there's no room for this liberalness. But I want to say, you know, in the Gongchik way, there is a way, you know, to even include uh, such narrow interpretations and say, it's okay. As long as yourself don't start subscribing to the narrowness, uh, then you can make room. <laughs> My own interpretations, okay, <clears throat> may or may not yeah, gain the approval of Kyoba Rinpoche, but this is the way I'm reading. And the way I'm understanding, you know, how to take this, you know, into my own. Dr. Lan? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the recollection of Dharma, mm -hmm. when we talk about perfect in meaning, perfect mm -hmm. in words, Mm -hmm. So is it okay if I use the concept that we discussed just now to understand this? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Sure. In meaning, it means that the definitive meaning that yes. leads to the ultimate goal, and then the perfect in words that's a skillful approach of uh, yes, the exactly. So, perfect in words means is suited for the occasion. So it. Skillfully manifest in those uh, six yes. parameters. Yes, the six parameters, correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, waiting is linking uh, our earlier practice where uh, recollecting the qualities of Dharma, it says perfect in words and perfect in meaning. Perfect in words means, you know, it's suitable to the occasion, to the listener. Uh, so sometimes Buddha had to speak uh, strongly. Sometimes Buddha has to speak eh, in a very kind of uh, soft way. So no matter strongly or softly, those are perfect words, as in exactly eh, what's needed on that occasion. But no matter strong or soft words, the meaning is always perfect, as in it leads to... Eh, to really understanding uh, this or that aspect of the fundamental nature. Ninety two, yeah. Mm. Let, let me read this. This is Sobish's notes, huh? it's helpful. But if the meaning is the same, huh? here, uh, right before that, he's talking about uh, Chodra was mostly concerned with talking about some of the more kind of uh, outrageous statements that you can find in the Tantras. Uh, some of the more kind of provocative statements. Uh, uh, so there Sobish said in the section before, it's like um, that basically as from, from Kyoba Rinpoche's uh, way of, of you know, uh, understanding, um, both, the, both the meaning of secret mantra and the meaning of sutra, so esoteric and exoteric, uh, it's the same. So here then Sobish goes, but if the meaning is the same as in the openly taught exoteric tradition, what is there to be kept hidden by using symbolic language? In other words, why does the Buddha use symbolic language in the Tantras? I think that here in the system of the Drigumpa, what is meant to be kept hidden is the actual mantra method of stopping thoughts, controlling winds keeping discriminative knowledge and means inseparable, purifying the impure channels and so on, 
since without proper guidance, they are potentially harmful. The methods could be potentially harmful. Jikten Sungun certainly does not accept a mantra path in which the Buddha intended a meaning that differs from the exoteric Mahayana path. A good example is the use of alcohol as taught in Vajra Statement 524. What is virtuous in the Vinaya is also virtuous in mantra, and what is non-virtuous is non-virtuous. The intention in mantra and the Vinaya is the same, to abandon alcohol. However, when the correct method is ably applied, an alcohol is in all respects of smell, taste, and power transformed into nectar, it can be consumed since it is no longer alcohol. Here too, there is no separate secret intention, such as permitting alcohol in mantra and prohibiting it in the Vinaya. So that statement, especially when we go to the secret mantra section, you know, it really shows you, you know, uh, to me, um, you can say I'm biased, and maybe I am because I'm biased to the Gong Chik, you know. You can see a lot of things that, you know, to this day, people say, oh, Vajrayana is like this, oh, Vajrayana is like that. You know, if you really think through some of these things that they say, you're like, that doesn't make any sense. Somehow alcohol is permitted here, not permitted there. Somehow monks cannot engage in sexual activity. Non-monks can. If we think the issue is can and cannot, we, we have missed something fundamental that we have not understood. The issue is really not about can or cannot, actually. So the chapter, especially the next few chapters, like the Vinaya chapter and the secret mantra chapter, you know, like it will, you know, it will bring up all these, uh, st the statements will bring up all these like weird understanding that is floating around during Jiten Sungun's time, floating around during our own time, I'll say. You can see you know, if you agree or not. Anyway, uh, obviously, we're not going to be looking at 6.2. Now, 6.2, uh, some, you know, uh, uh, guidance. 6.2 um, is a statement that says, basically, uh, outer phenomena, what we think to be out there, the things that we experience that we think are out there, are basically of the mind. And then, of course, that translation I read to you, right? Kyuba Rinpoche's teaching is basically all about that. And so then Sherab Jungne tells us, this is in response to the people who think uh, that outer phenomena and inner experience are not connected. Now, you can say that there are no principled uh, lineages or groups of people in Tibet uh, that subscribe to that belief, for sure. So this is not in response to, you know, some tradition or, or some practitioner, practitioners thinking that way you know, or some philosophy that teaches that. Actually, no, no philosophy uh, and no, no Buddhist philosophical traditions in, in, in Tibet uh, actually believes that. So what it is addressing is not so much uh, any kind of established position by any group or anything like that, but it's more, I think, addressing what we kind of sometimes, you know, or a lot of times, how we, uh, in a very gut level, things, you know, whatever that is out there that we experience uh, is out there, and then I am in here, uh, and that's out there. And not seeing that, in fact, all our experiences are determined, conditioned, colored, and even made up by our own mind. 
Therefore, blue cheese stinks to you, tasty to me. Durians stinks to me and tasty for you. <laughs> if durian and blue cheese is just out there, unrelated to the mind that experiences it, then definitively, if we want to use that language, it either stinks or tastes good. And no matter who gets into contact with that, with this, it will stink. With this, it will be tasty. But it says no. All the multiplicity is the result of our own mind. That's sort of the gist of 6-2. So we'll look at 6-2. Uh, on Wednesday. Chang Chu Sem Chu Rin Poche Maki Banam Ke Girchi Ke Banyam Parme Wong Ling Gong Du Pell War Show.